John chapter 15. And we will uh, begin reading in verse 12 in just a moment. Uh, I love this passage of scripture. In John 13, 33, Jesus says to his disciples, little children, I'm with you a while longer, a little while longer. Uh, and I believe Jesus was referring to his disciples as his little children because of his affection for them. In 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. So Paul says we're servants of Christ, we're stewards of Christ. In other words, what we have, God is going to hold us responsible for what we've done with what we have because what we have belongs to him and we're his servants. But Paul says, uh, something more more than that uh, so we're, we're his servants we're God's children because we put our faith in Christ in Mark 3 35 Jesus says for whoever does the will of God he is my brother and sister and mother so we're part of the family of Christ we're brothers and sisters together with him and then, oh, by the way, um, if you've had an older brother or sister, uh, I hope they've set a good example for you. With the Lord Jesus, he sets the best example for us of how we're supposed to behave. In our passage today, Jesus says, uh, you are my friends, in verse 14, if you do what I command you. Are you a friend of Jesus? Let's jump into this passage. John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you that you love one another. So the first question I want to ask about this question, passage is what is love? What is love? Jesus commands us to love one another, so I want to know what love is to be sure I'm keeping his command. So I looked up in a dictionary, an English dictionary, to see what love is. It says, a strong feeling of affection and concern toward another person, or a strong feeling of affection and concern for another person accompanied by uh, romance. <laughs> Uh, a feeling of devotion or adoration toward God. So we're to love God, we're adore, to adore him. Of course, we're not to adore one another uh, in, in that sense, but we're to have affection and concern for others. Now notice affection, that's an emotional aspect, but concern, that can be a choice that we make. In other words, I think love is more than just a feeling. I think we are have strong feelings of affection for others, but we're also to choose to do what is best for others. Uh, Paul says, uh, uh, now, don't misunderstand me, love is something more than just what you do. In 1 Corinthians 13, 3, Paul says, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, well, that would be awesome to do all that. But do not have love, it profits me nothing. So your motive is very important. Yes, we are to help other people. We're to seek to bless other people, show them kindness, help them as needed, but the motive is very important. Are we doing it so that others can think how wonderful we are? 
or we're doing it because we love them and we're seeking to please God with our lives. So what type of love are we to have for each other? John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this that would lay down his life for his friends. Uh, okay, I, I have to be honest. If, if I have to give my life for someone, that would be a tough decision. I mean, I'm just being honest here. But is it too much to ask if someone is in need in our church, maybe in our community, that we give something to help them? I think surely we can do something like that as, as God leads us. There are times when we need to show love towards others when they fail in their Christian life. Now, this is very important. I hope you'll hear what I have to say here. And let me cite the passage here from Galatians 6, verses 1 through 5. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he is deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. When a Christian is caught in sin, the temptation is for other Christians to judge them and condemn them and perhaps say negative things about them. But Paul says to seek to restore those who are fallen in sin. He says, bear one another's burdens. And then, in, in other words, instead of condemning someone for their failure, we're to love them and bear their burden. We're to weep with those who weep. We're to seek to restore them instead of just condemn them. The word here for burden uh, indicates a heavy load, but it has special reference here in, in Paul's con context in Galatians to speak of the heavy weight that temptation and spiritual failure can bring on us. And we're to seek to restore someone like that, seek to help them, encourage them. And Maybe the more spiritual members of the congregation should lead the way, like the pastor or the deacons and so forth, in restoring such a person. But the rest of the congregation can pray for them and seek to encourage them. <coughs> to bear someone's burden, we have to lay aside the attitude that we think we're better than other people. We have to lay aside that attitude and we're tempted to compare ourselves with other people. Now, you know, I'm really good. What if I compare myself to other people? No, we're not to do that. <coughs> we're to look, to examine ourselves to be sure there's not something in our life that's inappropriate. And we're to seek to love others and encourage them. And, and maybe this uh, word here, to boast, verse four in Galatians, 6 4 <coughs> says, uh, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. I think what Paul's saying is when we are seeking to really serve the Lord and love others and encourage them and seeking to restore them instead of condemning them, then we have some self satisfaction and some self fulfillment. It's not that we can boast about how wonderful we are. No, it's, it's rather that we can have a sense of, of, of uh, self-acceptance and, and self-fulfillment as we're serving the Lord. By the way, Christians grow by caring for one another and nurturing each other. So Jesus commands us to love one another just as he loves us. And now consider who are the friends of Jesus. Look at verses 14 and 15. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, what if I was to tell you this morning, you are my friends if you do what I command you? 
and say, no, wait a minute, preacher. <laughs> That's not right. That would be kind of egotistical of me to say something like that. But it was not egotistical of Jesus <laughs> to say this. He was God in the flesh. So we're going to be judged by whether or not we have obeyed God. Now, thankfully, all our sins are forgiven, but he's going to reward those who are faithful. And, and I don't want to be just saved as through fire, as uh, 1 Corinthians mentioned some, maybe saved as through fire. Uh, God wants to bless us. Who are the friends of Jesus? They are the ones who do what God commands that we do. So here's the choice in life. Either we submit to God and we're his friend, or we reject God and we're his enemy. That's the choice. <coughs> and then Jesus says in John 15, 15, no longer do I call you slaves for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Now the word for slaves here can be translated as servant. In other words, a slave or a servant might be told by the master to do something. And he might not be told why, but you've got to go do this. You're the servant. You've got to do it. But Jesus says, I've shared with you what the Father has shared with me. So you are my friend. <coughs> Our friendship with Christ involves love and obedience, but it also involves knowledge. He doesn't tell us everything we want to know. He wants us to trust him. But he often informs us and guides us and leads us, especially through his word. Warren Wearsby once wrote, I can never forget the impact on my own heart when I heard Dr. Oswald Sanders say to the Back to the Bible staff, each of us is as close to God as we choose to be. Do you hear that? You and I are as close to God as we choose to be. He's right. So how close to God do you want to be? It's your choice. You get to choose. Now when Paul spoke of himself as a servant, he meant he willingly and humbly served and obeyed God. Since Jesus had opened himself to his disciples, the term slave or servant didn't fit the relationship. He was a friend of his disciples and they were his friends. Adrian Rogers once said, I thought this was great, that's why I'm quoting him. Don't call yourself a friend of Jesus if you don't love me. I cannot call myself a friend of Jesus if I do not love you. <coughs> He has commanded us to love one another. If we're a friend of Jesus, we need to love one another. And he says again, uh, don't call yourself a friend of Jesus if you don't love me. <laughs> Rogers also mentioned three characteristics of friendship, and I thought these were very helpful. I want to share them with you. A friend sharpens, a friend sticks, and a friend stabs. You may say, well, that doesn't sound like a friend. Well, hear me out. <coughs> a friend sharpens. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. A true friend will seek to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. If someone seeks to lead you away from the Lord, they're not your friend. So a friend sharpens, iron sharpens iron. Be careful whom you choose for your friend. 
So many people today have lost their purity. They've become uh, addicted to drugs. Maybe they've been divorced. They're in jail. And often this is because of their so-called friends. Not only does a friend sharpen, a friend sticks. Listen to this from Proverbs 17, 17. And this is parallel language, okay? A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. What does that mean? A brother is born for adversity. The previous portion of this verse explains it. A friend loves at all times. So a friend, someone who's truly your friend, when you're going through adversity, they stick with you. They're going to be there for you because they love you, they are your friend. That's why uh, I like what uh, Rod, Adrian Rogers said, a friend uh, sharpens, a friend sticks. He sticks with you or she sticks with you during the difficult times of life. If you wanna find out who your true friends are, when you make a big mistake in your life, the people who are still there seeking to help you and love you and encourage you. They are your two friends. And then Roger said also, a friend stabs. What's he talking about here? Listen to this verse, Proverbs 27, verse six. <coughs> Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Uh, a doctor may stab you with a knife because he's trying to help you get better. <laughs> a friend may say something that hurts your feelings, but they say it in love because you need to hear what they have to say. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. <laughs> a true friend will love you enough to confront you when you're misguided and they will seek to help you to restore your relationship with the Lord. They love you too much not to speak to you face to face about what you're going through. We need to challenge one another with love and kindness. That's what we're to do as friends. We're to stick it to we can just, uh, uh, stick it to uh, no. stick with each other, <laughs> not stick it to each other. Stick with each other, but then sometimes we're to <clears throat> stab each other. In other words, we're to be truthful and honest and speak, and then hurt may hurt someone's feelings in the process. But it's because we love someone. We want to share the truth. Judas pretended to be a friend of Jesus, but he was not a true friend. There are some people who will pretend to be your friend, but they're really only concerned about what they can get out of the relationship. They don't <coughs> care so much for you. So what are some things that people want in life that we can provide as friends? You might want to make note of these. First is acceptance. God accepts you as you are. Uh, I'm so thankful he does. <laughs> uh, I've had sin in my life, and I'm so thankful God accepted me in spite of my sin. He accepts you in spite of your sin. And we're to accept others. Now, that doesn't mean we're proving <coughs> your sinfulness, but we're not to reject them just because they have sin in their life. So God accepts us and we're to accept others. Second, people want to be acknowledged, recognized. Um, in other words, God wants us to be uh, recognizing others, showing appreciation to others, not just ignoring them. God acknowledges us. He has a place for every one of us in his family. He has plans for each one of us. So people 
want to be acknowledged. Also, people want to be accepted. I've mentioned that, and people want to be appreciated. I'm still working on this, but uh, I try not to take people for granted. I try to express appreciation to people. Uh, there are many of you who are very kind and gracious. In fact, all of you <laughs> that are here today. Um, and it's good to not take people for granted, not take friends for granted, but be appreciative of what they do. You may say, well, uh, can we appreciate people who've got some failure in their life? Yes. Uh, listen to what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. And I'll just read one verse that he wrote. But uh, the Corinthian church had a lot of issues, a lot of problems, but this is what Paul wrote. In 1 Corinthians 1, 4, he said, I thank my God always concerning you. How about that? I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. <laughs> so whatever failure someone has in their life, you could say, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. People want to be accepted, acknowledged, appreciated, and affirmed in other words, we need to be cautious about saying negative things about people. And uh, if people, by the way, if people say negative things about you, I would encourage you uh, not to take that to heart. <laughs> Believe what God says about you. He loves you. He, Jesus loved you enough to take his, you know, allow himself to die on the cross for you. Uh, he loves you. And uh, we're in a very negative world. People tend to criticize one another and we need to seek to affirm one another. And here's the fifth, fifth thing people want to be assured. They want understanding. There are times when you and I need to uh, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Not put on an act, but it needs to be something in our life where we have a genuine love and concern for others. <laughs> now, if you want to keep your heart so it's never broken, I want you to hear what C.S. Lewis once wrote. He says, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be uh, wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one. Wrap it carefully with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it safe in a casket of your own selfishness. There it will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. It costs something to love people but it's worth it. We don't need to put our love in a little casket. Here's a prayer I would suggest for us as believers. Oh God, help me to find someone that I can love and cultivate for Jesus and help us to make our church a family of friends. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for your love. And as we seek to obey you and love you and love others, we can pray and you, God will answer, you will answer prayers in ways that you may be glorified. <laughs> Help us to love you with all our heart so that when we pray, we're praying according to your will and that your prayer, our prayers will be answered in a way that glorifies you. Lord, I pray for our time together here in these next few moments that you'll have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand with me?